Thank you for being here tonight. It's been a good night already. We've enjoyed a good meal downstairs, and we are excited to continue our summer series, get started with our services tonight. I do have some updates for you on our prayer list as we get started. David Hust has been at Medco for rehab, but he fell and is back at Henderson Hospital right now. So please continue to remember him in your prayers. Uh, Glada Daniel, this is the mother of Marlena Buchanan, is in critical condition. We've been asked to remember her and the family in our prayers. And uh, Sunday we announced about Zach Cook, a family friend of Barbara Ray, was struck by lightning and is in Vanderbilt. I also understood he's in pretty serious condition as well. So please remember them. Sherry West has COVID, so please keep her in your prayers. Those are updates on our prayer list. A couple things to tell you about coming up as well. Um, don't forget the book to honor Dr. Barnett. If you'd like to pick up one of those note cards, write him a note. And if you'll send us a four by six or smaller, but four by six is the biggest we can handle picture, we'll include that with your note. We're gonna give that to him on July 27th, the last night of our summer series, we'll do that. So get those turned into as soon if you will. Also, if you plan to attend the Wednesday night meal next week, there's a sign up sheet in the lobby. Please sign up for that. We'll have breakfast together this Friday at Eastgate Restaurant at 9.30. If you're free, you're invited. So uh, I didn't say breakfast was free, but if you're free, you're invited to Eastgate at 9.30. Anybody who can join for breakfast will be glad to have you. The youth group will play Ultimate Frisbee on Friday at 7 o'clock behind Bengate Elementary School. See Josh if you need details on that. Our annual EMS Appreciation Luncheon will be July the 16th from 11 to 1. We do need volunteers to serve and deliver food. If you can help, just show up at the building by 1030 that Saturday. And we will have a come and go baby shower for Jackson and Caitlin Baker on Sunday, July 17th. That'll be from 1.30 to 2.30 down in the fellowship hall. They're expecting a girl and they are registered online at babylist.com. Those are all the announcements that I've got. As we get ready to get started tonight, Bob McIndoe has our opening prayer. David Arthur is our song leader. Dan Chambers is our speaker tonight. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in just a moment. And Greg Atkinson will have our closing prayer. If there's nothing further, David, let's begin our devotional time. Good evening.
But before we start into our prayer, I just found out that uh, Zach Cook has, has passed away, the one that was struck by lightning. So we will remember him in our prayer as well. Bow with me, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this time that we can come together and worship you and study from your word. Father, we're thankful for this cool building that we have where we can come when it's hot and still meet in all the comforts that we would want. Father, we ask that you'd be with uh, Brother Chambers tonight as he stands before us and brings us a lesson and help us pay close attention to what he has to say. And we ask, we're thankful for their safe trip here and that you give them a safe trip back home. Father, we're thankful for the star of a crop that we have. And if it be possible and in your will, we ask that you bring some rain that this crop can continue to finish on out. Father, we ask that you watch over the Cook family as they mourn the loss of their loved one and their family. Father, we're thankful for this church and what it means to this community, and we ask that you continue to be with the leadership and help us to grow this church and help spread your word throughout the world. Father, we ask that you be with those that were mentioned that were sick, continue to be with those who are attending to them that they might soon get better. Father, as we begin this class, we want to remember that your son was sent to this earth to die for our sins, and we're so thankful for that. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids down to the Kingdom Kids class, and Again, as we do every week, we're going to say thank you to everybody who helps teach in that Kingdom Kids class. That is such a, a good thing, and our teachers that get the summer off appreciate that as well. So all of our fifth grade and down kids, head on down there. I want you to know that I was following directions. So if you look in the bulletin and see Dan Chambers' picture... And then you look at Dan Chambers, you might say he's had a haircut since then. Um, if you remember, Dan's been with us a few times before. You might remember this is Dan's haircut he's had for a long time now. When Dan sent me his picture, he said, Brother, if there's anything you can do to make me look like Tom Cruise, I'd appreciate it. I did all that I could with a little help from some Photoshop experts. But uh, we gave him Tom Cruise's uh, hair and eyebrows, but that was as good as we could get. But uh, so, so I present to you Dan Cruz Chambers tonight. Dan, uh, Dan's a good friend of mine. He and I were, it, we had some classes together in grad school. We have been around each other for many years now. Dan's been preaching for more than three decades. He is in his 14th year at the, Brent, at the, as the pulpit minister for the Concord Road Congregation in Brentwood. Dan has done some writing. I, I love Dan's books and I love to listen to Dan speak. So Dan mentioned in his bio, he wrote Churches in the Shape of Scripture. You guys know that book because I've preached from it a bunch and cited it several times and keep copies of it in my office to hand out. But uh, tonight, if you've got a copy of that, you can get it autographed, so that's kind of cool. Dan is here with his wife, Leola, and we are sure glad she could make this trip again. Uh, they have two grown children, one son-in-law. Leola, Dan wrote this without proofing it and getting you to proof it. It says one nearly perfect grandbaby. So uh, I don't know what caused him to say nearly perfect, but I'll let y'all handle that. But uh, I'm excited to have Dan with us. He is always a, a delight. And so I'm going to turn things over to Dan tonight. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. It is so good to be here. David and I were kind of putting our heads together and trying to figure out the last time I was here. We think it was in 18, I think the year before, the year before, the year before, the world stopped. And so, uh, so we think it was 2018. It is great to be back. I really appreciate David so much. I really appreciate his effort to make me, try to make me look like Tom Cruise. I, I noticed it did not work. And... Uh, you know, all I thought I needed was the hair and the eyebrows, and maybe I would, but no, no such luck. And so, oh, well, nice try, brother. I owe you one for that. I really owe you one for that. I, um, 
Uh, we're going to take a look tonight. If you've got your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. So we take a look at one of my, one of my favorite characters in all of the Bible, and that is Elijah. And so 1 Kings chapter 18 is where you want to go. And uh, one of the things I always like to do before I get started is just ask a special blessing on our time together. So if you don't mind, let's bow once more. Father, we are so thankful again for this period of, of worship and study. And, and, and now, Father, just a special blessing we're asking for on our study. We pray that our hearts will be open to your word. We're so thankful for these words you brought to us through your spirit. And Father, we pray that they will sink down into our hearts, that they'll take hold of our hearts, that we'll understand, that we'll be inspired, that we'll be instructed. And Father, that if necessary, we will be corrected. And so it's in the name of Jesus we would ask you to bless these few moments that we spend in study. And we say, Amen. Well, Elijah, one of the, as I said, one of the great characters in Scripture. Uh, chapter 18 is one of the most familiar episodes that you're going to find in either the New Testament or the Old Testament. Uh, and, and then chapter 19, I love the fact that these two chapters are together in Elijah's life because what you see in chapter 18, as we're going to look at here in just a second, is Elijah at his best. And what we're going to see in chapter 19 is Elijah at his worst. Now, at his best in chapter 18, you might remember that he's standing on top of Mount Carmel. Uh, he has, by the word of God, announced that there is going to be a drought in the land, that it's going to last for years uh, because Ahab and his queen Jezebel has just led the people of Israel into rip-roaring idolatry. They are so stubborn. They are so obstinate. They have rejected God. Jezebel has been absolutely determined that she's going to slaughter all of the prophets of God. And so Elijah kind of comes onto the scene almost out of nowhere and stands before Ahab and says, no rain until my word. And, and so uh, it's been about three years and so Elijah calls out then here at Mount Carmel, he calls out all of the representatives of the people of Israel, and, and so he says, meet me there on Mount Carmel. Uh, they're overlooking, Mount Carmel is in the northern part of Israel, and it actually looks, overlooks this fertile plain that runs from the east to the west uh, of Israel, and it's called the, the Plain of Jezreel or the Valley of Jezreel. Sometimes you'll see it called the Plain of Esdralon. But it really is and was, especially at that time, the breadbasket of ancient Israel. And so uh, as he calls them to that location overlooking that, there's real significance there because they have given themselves to worship of Baal, who was the storm god. They believe that he was the one who brought the rain. He was the one who provided fertility. And, uh, and so it's kind of like supposedly Baal's home stadium. And what's going to happen here is, is Elijah, of course, is going to challenge the people of Israel to make a decision. Who is really God? Is, is God, is Yahweh really God or is Baal really God? And he's going to ask God to make a demonstration to prove to all the people of Israel that he's God and that Elijah is his man. And so that's what happens. All the people of Israel gather together and here he is. I mean, you want to talk about inspiring. It is really inspiring because he's all alone. Uh, he's standing there all alone. I mean, here's these you know, hundreds of prophets of Baal. Here's all of the representatives of the people of Israel. Here is, and they have given their hearts to Baal. Here is Ahab who is hunting down all of the prophets of God. And here is, here's Elijah. He is all alone and he is bold. He is so full of faith. Uh, his heart is absolutely with God. And, and you won't see a, 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 a better demonstration anywhere in Scripture of a person who is bold in their faith. And so it's quite a day. And so by the time this day's over... 
Uh, God does show all of the people of Israel, he does show that he is the one true and living God and that Elijah is his man. Elijah is his spokesman. And when the day is over, all of the prophets of Baal are slaughtered. The people are crying out, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh is God, he's God. And then we see, of course, Elijah in this miraculous moment outrun Ahab's chariot down the valley of Jezreel back to his winter palace there in the town of Jezreel, which is on the, like the west side, the east side, rather, of, the, of that valley. Well, we come to chapter 19. And when we come to chapter 19, as I said, we go from that incredible moment, that incredible demonstration of bold faith in chapter 18, and we come to chapter 19, and the guy that we see is very different than the guy that was just standing on that mountain. What happens when we come to chapter 19 is Ahab gets back to the palace and he is telling his wife, the queen, all about what happened. He's telling about how Elijah mocked him and mocked all of the prophets and had all of the prophets killed and he is whining and he is just recounting all of those events. Now we need to understand that even though Ahab was the king, he's really kind of spineless. Uh, it, what we have here in Ahab and Jezebel is really what some people call a petticoat government. He's technically the leader, but she's really the leader. She's, she's the power behind the throne. And he's spineless and don't really know what to do, but she's not spineless. And she knows exactly what to do. She knows exactly what has to be done because she knows exactly what's at stake here. And what's at stake is, for, for her and Ahab, everything is at stake. Their power, their position, um, and everything that is kind of just is corollary to that. And so she knows what has to happen is uh, Elijah has to die. And he has to die quickly and decisively and violently. And so she sends a message to Elijah. And the message that she sends to him is in verse 2 of chapter 19. And it basically says this. By tomorrow, by this time tomorrow, I swear by all of the gods, you are a dead man. Let's just take a look at it. Here are her words. So may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. You are dead. Well, if you don't know the story, what you would almost expect coming out of chapter 18, you would almost expect Elijah to say, bring it on. Because, I mean, we just saw him at Mount Carmel. And he's standing there and he's basically saying to Ahab and all of the prophets of Baal and all of the representatives of Israel, he's basically saying, bring it on. We're going to have a test here and we're going to see who is the real true living God. We're going to see who is the one who brings rain and fertility into the crop. We're going to see who gets credit for that. And so you think that that's what's going to happen. But when she sends that message to him, that is not what happens. He hears that and he just folds like a house of cards. Suddenly he is terrified. And what he does is he bolts and he runs for the hills and he runs as far as he can. And when he gets as far away as he can, he runs even further and he is out of there. Now, like I said, what you see here is Elijah in his best moments and Elijah in his worst moment. And I really like this. I really like it, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, this really speaks to me on a personal level. I just got to be real honest with you. And what I mean by that is there are times when I kind of feel that way. There are times when I just feel so full of faith. I just feel bold for God. I feel strong for God. I just feel like I can stand up for God. 
And then there are times when it's like, man, things are just, I feel weak and I feel scared and I just feel like running away. There are times in life when everything seems good. You know, the job's going good. The wife, the marriage is going good. The kids are doing good. You know, everything's going good. And then suddenly things can turn on a dime. And, you know, the marriage is struggling. The job's not going that great. The kids, they're not doing that great either. That's just how life happens. You know, I'm reminded of that. If, if you have your Bibles and, and you just want to kind of see that happen, you can turn over to the book of Matthew. Just hold your place here in, in 1 Kings. We'll come back to it, of course. Uh, but if you look over in Matthew chapter 26, you'll see what I mean when I say things can turn on a dime. Well, here in chapter 26 of Matthew, you'll remember this one. Um, when you get down and... and um, you find Peter here. This is as Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper. And, and, and he's just, you know, this is, uh, this is that moment. The shadow of the cross is really looming over them. And Jesus has just said that uh, in verse 31, you will all fall away because of me this night. And, and look at Peter in verse 33. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. I mean, there he was in all of his boldness, all of his strength. Lord, you, I, I don't know about these other guys, they may very well fall away, but there is one person that you can always count on. One person you're never going to have to worry about. One person who always has your six, one person who always has your back. If everyone else lets you down, there is one person you, who will never let you down, and you're looking at him. That's what we find there in verse 33. Well, if you just turn over and, and by the end of the chapter, we don't even get out of the chapter. By the end of the chapter, you finally find Peter in verse 74, then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man, and immediately the rooster crowed. You see what I mean? That's how quickly things can turn. Things can absolutely turn on a dime. And suddenly we can have these Elijah moments. These moments when we just seem so full of fear and our faith seems so weak. Now, let me tell you why you're going to have these Elijah moments. See, this, isn't, this lesson isn't about how to prevent having those Elijah moments. It's not about that. You're going to have these Elijah moments. And I'll tell you, the reason you're going to have these Elijah moments, there's really a couple of reasons that you're going to have them. And the first one is, well, well just turn over to the book of James, James chapter 5. I'm going to show you the reason you are going to have these Elijah moments in your life. If you look at James chapter 5, James tells us something about Elijah in verse 17. James chapter 5, look at verse 17. James says this, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Uh, this is why you're going to have an Elijah moment. You're just a human being like Elijah was. Elijah had these moments because he was a human being. You know, you kind of read that in verse 17 and sometimes you just... Sometimes you just don't think about that because sometimes when we think of people like Elijah, they just seem different than we are. You know, it's sometimes hard to believe as we're watching God use men like that. It's just sometimes hard to believe that, well, that they're just like us. No, no, they are just like us. It is absolutely true. That's why I had moments like that. That's why one minute he can be so full of faith and that's why the next minute he can be running away as fast as he can because he's just a man. And he has the same kinds of weaknesses and struggles that we do. It's kind of like Paul in Romans chapter 7. Here's another example of that. Turn over to Romans chapter 7. 
In Romans chapter 7, in, beginning in verse 14, Paul really, you'll find a man just frustrated. And he's frustrated with himself. And what he's frustrated about is this constant struggle with being what he's supposed to be, what God wants him to be and what he wants to be. And he talks about that. He talks about the reality of constantly having to fight against this fallen, broken, sinful nature that we all have. You know, when, 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 when I was baptized into Christ and I came up out of the waters of baptism, I came up just like you. I was redeemed. But I came up redeemed, but, but I, my body is still unredeemed. And I'm even, you know, when I came up out of that baptistry, I've still been dragging around this unredeemed body ever since then. And I'll still be dragging around this unredeemed body until I die or Jesus comes back. And so until then, it's just, it can be a struggle. The fight with sin is a struggle. And it's so frustrating. And you'll see Paul talk about that. He says, verse 15, uh, verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. And then he says in verse 17, So now no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. He's so frustrated with this struggle that's just ongoing. And he gets down in verse 24 and it just kind of comes to a head. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? And then he gives glory in verse 25 to God, knowing that eventually God is going to set him free from the brokenness of this body. You know, I know some people who actually read that and go, well, that can't be, Paul can't be talking about himself here. He can't be. He's Paul, they say, as though he's some kind of faith superhero, as though, like, Temptation just bounces off him like bullets bounce off Superman. And that's not true. Paul's just a man like we are. He's just as human as we are. And so that's why I say you're going to have Elijah moments. I can't tell you how to make sure do this, 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 and you won't have one of those Elijah moments where your faith seems just so weak because you're going to have them. Because you're just a person. That's one reason you're going to have an Elijah moment. But you better be ready for him. You're going to have it. Let me tell you a second reason that you're going to have an Elijah moment. The second reason is because Satan. And that is Satan is never going to stop pursuing you. You are in his crosshairs. And he is never ever going to stop. He is tenacious. He is unrelenting. Uh, if he fails in one attack, he is going to regroup for another attack. You remember when he was testing Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 in that divinely orchestrated temptation and Jesus is there in 40 days fasting in the wilderness? Well, look at Luke's account of that. You'll find it in Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, we're told something. Luke adds something that Matthew doesn't add about that moment. And here's what it adds. Look at verse 13. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him. That is, he left Christ. Now, but these next four words are so important. I've underlined them in my Bible. He left him until an opportune time. He wasn't done with Jesus. And he's not done with us. There are going to be those times when he is just bombarding us with temptation and we, we might stand strong and resist. He's not done forever. He's not done forever. He's going to come back. Well, someone asks, well, well what, about, what about like James chapter 4 and verse 7? Well, let's take a look at that. What about James chapter 4 and verse 7? James chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, well that says he's going to go, if we resist him, he's going to go away. Now listen, this is really important. This is an important principle of Bible study you need to remember. And that is, 
Uh, we have to read everything, including James chapter, verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 7, in the fuller context of Scripture. We can't isolate this verse from the rest of Scripture. And so when we understand this in the context of Scripture, what we understand is that we can win battles, resist this, this devil, and he will flee from us. That's talking about winning battles. Uh, that's, we know we can win battles, but we need to understand the rest of Scripture also teaches us that when we win battles, the war is not over. As long as there is breath in our body, Satan is going to continue attacking us and he will be back. Now, with that said, let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 19. And, and I think we can get some real instruction here from Elijah because we're going to see some triggers. We're going to see some common triggers that threaten our faith and what we need to do to strengthen our faith in those times. So let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 19 and let's take a look. All right, I'm going to give you three things that we see here in Elijah that we need to always be conscious of. What happened with Elijah can be instructive for us. The first thing that happened was this. This is, this is what makes our faith vulnerable. The first thing that we see is that in tough times, and this was tough times, Suddenly he gets the message from the queen, you're dead by tomorrow. He's facing some tough times. In tough times, Elijah lost sight of God. I want you to look at verse 3. After this contract is put out on him, it says, And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba. Now, if you've got the New King James, it says... Now, I've got the New American Standard that says he was afraid. It says in the New King James, and when he saw that, he arose. Also, if you've got the King James or the Old American Standard, and when he saw that. Um, they, uh, if you've got some translations, they'll actually have a footnote there that says what this might mean is when he saw it. Well, that's obviously what it was in a very real sense. He saw it. He came face to face with something that was terrifying. And when he came face to face with something that was terrifying, all he saw was what was terrifying. And he completely lost sight of God. Now, that is very common. You know, I think, for instance, about places like Numbers chapter 13 and verse 33, another familiar story in the Old Testament. When God has brought the people of Israel through the wilderness, they're on, they are just on the verge of entering the promised land. And the people of Israel have watched God working ever since He has brought them out of Egypt. They saw God perform extraordinary miracles. They stood at the Red Sea and they watched the Red Sea part and they walked through on dry land. And so you would think that they would never doubt, that they would never lose sight of God, that they would never stop thinking for a moment about His power and His sovereignty and His omnipotence. And yet when God says, go spy out the land, look what's there, 10 of those 12 spies came back and said, we can't do this. Verse 33 of Numbers chapter 13 says, there also, as they're given the report, we saw the Nephilim, uh, the sons of Anak, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. See there? We saw. We saw our adversaries and suddenly they go, we can't do this. That's what happens. When you lose sight of God, you get panicky. When you lose sight of God, your faith gets weak. Remember Peter? Remember when he saw Jesus walking on the water and he said, Lord, if it's really you, ask me, ask, ask me to come to you. And Jesus says, come on. And he stepped out of that boat and he started walking on the water. And you know what the text says? He saw the wind 
He saw the storm. Suddenly, he couldn't see Jesus anymore in the night. All he saw was the bad stuff. And the minute he saw the bad stuff and he lost sight of Jesus, he started going down. Well, that's what you have with Elijah here. And that's how there's a tendency for us to be. You know, it is so easy to say, God is good. He is good all the time. Praise God when everything's going good. But when everything kind of goes south and the bottom falls out of everything, sometimes we just lose sight of God and all we see are the problems. Now, I want you to see what God did in this situation. What God does in this situation, go back to 1 Kings chapter 19, what he does. Now, the first thing that he does is kind of interesting here. Uh, we find that uh, Elijah, it says in verse 5, when he went, in verse 4, uh, he went a day's journey into the wilderness, came down, sat under a juniper tree. And then verse 5, he lay down and he slept under a juniper tree. So he went to sleep. It, the, he, the man's exhausted. And so God sends an angel and the angel wakes him up. Now, this is, this is great. This is really important. Uh, the, the angel doesn't wag his finger at Elijah and say, Get up, you coward. What are you doing? You're going the wrong way. He doesn't say that because Elijah is in a, just an emotionally and a physically weakened state. You know, everybody needs rest. And Elijah needed some. And so the angel says, Hey, listen, it's time to wake up. It's time to eat. You've got to keep your strength up. And so there he delivers this you know, meal of hot, fresh bread and cool water. It's gourmet meal. Now, that may not sound like gourmet to you, but when you're in the middle of a desert, hot, fresh bread and cool water is a gourmet meal. And then the text says, and he went back to sleep. And after he went back to sleep, let it, God let him sleep for a while. And then God had the angel wake him up again and at the end of verse 6. Uh, or, or in the 7 and 8 there. And uh, angel wakes him up again. Hey, listen, it's time to eat. And so again, feeds him. So he's strengthening physically. But then what happens, he comes to a cave, it says in verse 9. He came to a cave and he lodged there. And it's only then that God says, okay, Elijah, what you doing here? And Elijah basically says, I have been so zealous for you. I've done everything for you, and I am alone and left. There is no one else that is faithful to you except for me. And look what God does for him. God brings him to a place of revelation. What God basically says to Elijah is this. Elijah, you need to look up, and you need to see me. Now, that's what we need when we lose sight of God. When all we can see are our problems... We need a revelation. Uh, we need to see God. Uh, what happens here is you look at verse 11. God says, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And the earth, after the earthquake, a fire, and the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a gentle blowing. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And so what you have here is God is demonstrating his power to Elijah and Elijah is seeing God work. God is trying to get Elijah's eyes back on him to see that, Elijah, I am stronger. I am more powerful. I am sovereign. You can trust me. Elijah needed that clear vision of God again. That's what we need. You know, when things go bad and our faith gets weak, a lot of times what people do, they disengage from the Lord. They stop going to church. They stop reading their Bible. They, they lose sight of God, and, and that's the worst thing that can happen. What they need, what we need in those moments, we need a clear revelation of God. We need to be reminded that God is sovereign, that God is there, that God does care. 
that God has the love for us and the power to help sustain us in these difficult, troubling times. And that's what God is doing for Elijah at that moment. Uh, he, is, uh, he is trying to get Elijah refocused again on him. Uh, you know, it's the same thing in the book of Job. As, as Job is just everything has fallen apart in his world. He's lost everything. I mean, one moment he, everything is good, and the next moment he's standing beside ten fresh graves. All the kids are dead. He's lost everything. His health is just, uh, he's so infected uh, that his friends who come to see him, they don't even recognize him. He is so swollen up and just sores all over his body. And Job can't figure it out. His friends are trying to explain how God works in the world, and they've got it all wrong. Uh, they, they actually believe that the way God works in the world is if you do good, God rewards you. If you do bad, God punishes you. And so, Job, you just need to come clean because whatever you've done, wow, it is really bad. And Job's going, listen, I'm telling you, I, I have a clear conscience. I haven't done anything. Like that. I, I, I haven't. He wasn't saying he's perfect, but he knows he's been faithful. And finally, God speaks up. In about chapter 38, God comes and, and he says to Job, basically, uh, Job, you need to get up. Get up and let's take a walk around my garden. And God begins to talk to Job and he doesn't answer any of Job's questions. He doesn't discourse on the problem of pain and evil and suffering. He doesn't do any of that. He just asks him a series of questions. And all those questions are designed to say, look up. Look at me. Job, there is no one and nothing like me. You need to get a view of me again. You need to get your eyes on me again. And understand, when you, get your, when you see me clearly, you can trust me. And that's exactly what happened. Without any of his questions answered, Job saw God more clearly as God brought him to this place of revelation. God saw, he saw God more clearly than ever. He, he just threw himself down and said, please forgive me. He wrapped his arms around God more tightly than ever before and basically said, I'm going to trust you. That's what Job needed. He needed a, a clear, he needed to see God in the midst of his pain and suffering. It's what Elijah needed. He needed to see God. He just, it's just so easy to lose sight of God when things go south. And so that's when our faith gets weak. When troubles come, when bad times come, we can just lose sight of God and not see anything but troubles. And what we need is a clear revelation of God. We need to be in the Word. We need to be in a place where we're sitting under the Word we need to see God. Okay, let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 19 now and let's look at a second thing, a second problem that Elijah had that caused his faith to weaken. A second thing that we're going to see here is that he isolated himself from strengthening relationships. He isolated himself from strengthening relationships. Well, when he got scared, we already saw this. It says he just took off running, verse 3. He went and he arose and he ran. Verse, and it says at the end of verse 3, and he left his servant there. And then he by himself went a day's journey further into the wilderness. And so... He isolates himself, and there in his isolation, he felt completely alone. Now, in fact, he's going to say that two times. Look at the end of verse 10. He says, I've been faithful to you. And then he says, and I alone am left. And they seek my life and take it away. I'm, I'm the only one left. And then he's going to get down in verse 14 when God says to him again, Hey, Elijah, what are you doing here? He said the same thing, I, Lord, I've just been faithful to you. I've been zealous for you. And he says it again, and I alone am left. Now, so he says, God, there's just nobody. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm the last man standing for you. Now, what does God do for him in this instance? 
Well, when, when God, when he lost sight of God, when he took his focus off God, God brought him to a place of revelation. Now, when he's isolated himself from strengthening relationships, the first God thing God does is God gives him a little reality therapy. What God says to him is, no, you're not. No, you're not. In fact, it's in verse 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. No, you're not the only one left. You need to understand that. You think you're alone. You feel like you're alone. But there's other people. There's other people who are committed to me. There's other people who love me. There are other people who continue to serve me. And then notice what God does. The second thing God does after that little bit of reality therapy, he connects Elijah with someone who could minister to him and someone who could encourage him. Take a look at verse 15 and 16. Here's what God says to him. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Haziel the king over Aram, and Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat, he says, You shall anoint as a prophet in your place. Now look at 19. So he departed from there, and he found Elisha. He was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen, it says. And it says in the end of verse 19, And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. It says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. And he says, Please let me kiss my father and mother, then I will follow you. And uh, look at verse 21. So he returned from following him and took the pair of oxen, sacrificed them, boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen, gave it to the people they ate. And now watch these words. Then he arose and he followed Elijah and he ministered to him. God knew what Elijah needed. God, God knew he needed strengthening relationships. And so God says, you go get Elijah, Elisha. And he went and got Elisha. And it says, and Elisha rose and followed him and, and ministered to him. You know, if you look over in 2 Kings, turn over to 2 Kings. This is, this is pretty interesting. 2 Kings chapter 2. What we find here is the end of Elijah's life. And when you find Elijah at the end of his life, you know who's with him? Elisha. And Elisha's not leaving him. It came time for Elijah to go be with the Lord. And, uh, and so Elijah, verse 2, says to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. And look what Elisha says. I will not leave you. And then again, Elijah says to him in verse 4, Please stay here. And Elisha says at the end of verse 4, I will not leave you. And then Elijah says to him again in verse 6, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And Elisha goes, I will not leave you. That, that's amazing. That is a Christian companion. That is a godly companion. Elisha took that ministry of supporting and encouraging Elijah from the moment, this moment in 1 Kings chapter 19, and he wouldn't leave his side for the rest of his life. Elijah needed that. Elijah needed to get connected with people of faith. And listen, if we're going to survive tough times, we have to be connected to people of faith. We have to be. God knows that. In isolation, everything weakens. It's no surprise then that God calls us together regularly. It's no surprise that God doesn't leave us in isolation when we come to Him and put on Christ in baptism. He takes us at that moment and He puts us in a church. He puts us there and He tells us, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. He's not, he's not trying to make our lives miserable. He knows what we need. And we need strengthening relationships because if we don't have them, our faith weakens and our spiritual well-being is in jeopardy. Now, real quickly, one more thing. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19. The last thing that we're going to find is this. The last thing that we're going to see here is Elijah got discouraged 
by a lack of results. So this is the third thing that we see. The, the, the third trigger that triggered this collapse in his faith. First of all, he lost sight of God. All he did was see his troubles. God brings him to a place of revelation. He needs to see God again. Second thing, he isolated himself from strengthening relationships. God connects him with a person who would be there to minister to him and encourage him. Third thing is he looks around and he gets completely discouraged because of a lack of results. You know, he has that mega triumph in chapter 18. And then in chapter 19, there in verse 4 and verse 10 where he says, I'm, I'm, I'm all alone. He basically says that there, he says, I'm just a failure. Who am I, Lord? I am just a total and complete failure. And so he's completely discouraged about his ministry. Now let's look real quickly what God does to him and for him. This is what he needs. What did God do to help him in this situation when he's so discouraged? God says, hey, it's time to get back to work. It's time to get back to work. God let him rest for a while. He needed to rest. We already talked about that. But then he needed to get back to work. That's what I just read for you a minute ago uh, in verse 14 uh, or, or, or verse 15 and 16 where he says, okay, get up and you need to go here and you need to anoint him and you need to go here and anoint him and you need to go here and do this. Okay, you, you've had time to refresh. Now it's time to get back to faithful living. And that's what he does. Look at verse 19 again. So he departed from there, found Elisha, and he did exactly what God told him to do. It's time to get back to faithful living. As I said, I think that's so instructive for us because we can be so much like Elijah. There are going to be times when our faith is going to get very, very shaky uh, there are times when we're going to get down. There are times when we are going to get despondent. And it's in those times that we see here in 1 Kings chapter 19 what has to be done. When those times come, we need to stay in the Word. This is the place of revelation, the Word. We need to stay in the Word. We need to stay connected to His people. We need to stay faithful to His people and connected with His people. And we need to stay in His work that is faithful living. We need to keep living for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that we can think about these realities that we face. And we acknowledge that we face a reality in this fallen world of, of shaky faith at times. And Father, thank you for showing us in the life of Elijah how easily it can happen and how quickly it can happen. And thank you for showing us what we need. And I pray that we will all keep these things in mind. And when those Elijah moments come, Father, I pray for all of us that we will stay in your word, that we will stay connected with your people, and that we will continue on in faithful living. Father, we know that in those exercises that you will get us through those weak moments, that you are working in those moments to bring us once more to a place of strength. And so, Father, it's in the name of Jesus. We offer this prayer. We ask you to bless us, to sustain us in those moments. And we say, Amen. Well, let's have an invitation. I'm going to shift gears with you, and we're going to talk about something that's just completely unrelated. Um, about a story I read the other day uh, as I was, uh, it was online. And it, and, and it was a story about one of the guys in, in life that just kind of fascinates me. Some of you probably heard of him. He, his name is Alex Honnold. And he's like the world's greatest rock climber. And some of you maybe saw a few years ago a, a documentary film that was out about something that he did. It was called Free Solo. And uh, it won an Oscar. Uh, 
Alex Honnold, what makes him the world's foremost rock climber is he does something that 99.999% that, that of rock climbers would never do and they would all say it's never okay to do it. But what he does occasionally is what's called free soloing. That means he will climb these vertical sheer cliffs all over the world. Uh, he'll climb them sometimes without any safety equipment at all. And, and Free Solo is a documentary about him climbing the most famous wall on, on planet Earth. Uh, it's in Yosemite National Park. It's called El Cap, El Capitan, and it's 3,000 feet of vertical granite. And uh, no human being should be able to do what he did on that occasion. And after years of, of preparing, years of training, he would be on that wall hanging from ropes at times with toothbrushes trying to find just a little niche that he could put the tip of a finger in. And he had every move orchestrated. But he did it. And so he's, he's just so famous. And, and, and so I saw this article that talked about a new reality in his life. He became a father. He got married recently and he and his wife had a baby. And how that's changed perspective. And the interviewer who's talking to him says, um, says to him, you know, it's almost like you're not afraid of dying. And he said, oh, no, no, it's not that at all. He said, uh, I'm, it's, uh, it's not that I'm not afraid of dying. And so the interviewer said, well, then, you know, how do you deal with these situations? He said, well, you just have to decide that you're not going to die. And so when I read that, I did not say, oh, that's deep. When I read that statement, just decide that you're not going to die, I said, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Just decide that you're not going to die. Well, listen, I'm afraid that's a decision you don't get to make. You are going to die. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 makes that crystal clear. It is appointed and a man wants to die. You are going to, you can't just decide you're not going to die. I, you know, I don't want to die on the way home tonight. But, uh, you know, there's that possibility. You don't know what it's going to happen. Uh, we don't have any clue of what's going to happen. Life is so fragile and it is so frail. And sometimes death comes out of nowhere. You know that. So you can't decide that. But there is something you can decide. You can decide uh, to prepare for that inevitable death. Because uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 not only says that you're going to die, you're also going to stand before God. You will give an account to God. We all are accountable to the creator of the universe and we will all stand before him. But the great thing is you can decide how you stand before him. He has sent Jesus into this world to, to do what you can't do for yourself and that's take away your sins because he is crazy about you. He loves you and he wants you to spend eternity with him. And he's done all that he can do, but you've got to accept that. You've got to surrender to Jesus and you've got to take him on. Uh, so you can make that decision. And so... Tonight, what I want you to do is, and what I want to ask you is, have you decided to prepare for death? Because you're going to die. If you haven't decided that you're going to prepare, I hope that you'll make that decision right now. God tells us, He lays it out perfectly for us, how we prepare. We believe that He is the crucified and resurrected Messiah. Now, if you've done that, that's your first step, but that's not all there is to it. Uh, if you believe that, have you repented of your sins? That is, have you decided to surrender your life to Him and let Him have control of it and acknowledge that He is the Christ? But, and if you've, if you've done that, that's, that is great, but that's not it. The Bible tells us that all of that commitment culminates in the moment where we join Him in the likeness of His death and the likeness of his resurrection and Christian baptism, that that's the time and that's the place where God's going to meet us 
and apply the blood of Christ to us and wash away our sins. And so have you done that? If you've never decided to do that, I hope that you will make that decision tonight. Because you're going to die. And it could even be tonight. You don't really have a choice about that. But you do have a choice of how you'll stand before God. And if you need to obey the gospel tonight, please do so right now while together we stand and while we sing. lesson. Thank all of you for being here tonight. Greg's going to come and lead us in a dismissal prayer. It has been so good to be here tonight. Greg. Let us pray. Our loving Father in heaven, hallowed be your, your great and your mighty name. We're always grateful, Father, uh, for the opportunity to come together and uh, be able to uh, worship you, sing praises to your great name. We're grateful, Father, for this great day that you've uh, created for each and every person that's here tonight. Uh, we're grateful, Father, for Brother and Sister Chambers and them being here tonight. Uh, we just pray your, your blessings on Dan for the message he brought us uh, tonight and the passion with which he uh, presented it. We're just grateful, grateful for him, for both of them, and just pray that you'll watch over them and uh, take them safely, safely back home this evening. Uh, we just pray, Father, that you'll uh, walk with us, help us to walk with you this week, and everything we do, Father, help us and keep us in your light. Help us, Father, to be attentive to opportunities you might give us to be able to represent you. Uh, to help someone in need or encourage someone and hopefully uh, bring glory to your great and holy name. We're grateful, Father, for your son. We're grateful, Father, for the, the hope that we have because of what Jesus did of being able to spend eternity in your presence. We pray, Father, for your forgiveness. Pray, Father, for your uh, uh, unconditional love and your mercy and your grace. We're grateful for it, Father. It's in Jesus' name we ask this prayer. Amen.